Hey everyone, welcome to Silicon Alley Podcast. I'm William Glass, CEO and co-founder of Ostrich, and of course, your host of the Silicon Alley Podcast. On today's episode, I have Steve Hoffman, aka Captain Hoff. Now, Captain Hoff is a veteran of Silicon Valley and the entertainment industry. Now, before I jump into Steve's backstory and what you can expect on today's episode, please make sure to follow, subscribe if you have not already to the Silicon Alley Podcast. You want to make sure you get notified every time we drop an episode at 5 a.m. Eastern every Friday. Also, if you're listening to the podcast and you're thinking, man, that would really resonate with so-and-so, please share the podcast with so-and-so. We want to make sure that they get value as well and spread the love and wisdom. And on today's episode, the wisdom we're listening to is Steve Hoffman. He's called Captain Hoff in Silicon Valley and is the chairman and CEO of Founderspace, one of the world's leading incubators and accelerators. He's also an angel investor, limited partner at August Capital, and serial entrepreneur and author of several award-winning books, including Make Elephants Fly and an upcoming one called Surviving a Startup. Now, what you can expect on today's episode is Steve goes really deep into his story of how he was, came out of school as a filmmaker, wanted to become a filmmaker, ended up hacking his way into a pretty impressive role with no experience way over his head, and then leaving that to go find other opportunities and ended up starting his first business, which was a gaming company, and had a series of gaming companies, both bootstrapped as well as venture-backed, and talking about his experience through each of those and how he eventually ended up advising first his friends and then others and building his incubator around his experience and knowledge that he learned throughout starting a number of different companies on his own. Now, Steve has a ton of energy and you're going to absolutely love his storytelling abilities and some of the crazy things that happened throughout his career. So please, without further ado, here is the conversation with Steve Hoffman. You got no time to waste, but still you hesitate. All right. Well, Steve, excited to have you on the podcast and thank you so much for joining. Um, it's great to talk to you and have you on the Silicon Alley podcast. It's great to be here. Awesome. Well, I'm really excited for a couple of reasons. First off, you have done a ton of entrepreneurial things, which I'm super, super excited to dive into, as well as the fact that you've been on the other side, investing and helping grow uh, startups through your through founder space and through your investing. So I'm super excited to get both the entrepreneur perspective as well as from that investor side and uh, growth side. That would be great. Perfect. So, Steve, before we jump in, I got to have a hard-hitting question here to start off with. So, you go by Captain Hoff as a, as a nickname. Where did that nickname come from? Well, the nickname, I am the captain of Founder Space because we are a team. So, we, all, we work like a team, a sports team, and I am the coach for all the startups and companies that come in. So, that's Captain Hoff. Gotcha. Okay, perfect. Captain Hoff comes from coaching. I love that. I love that. I love that reference and the analogy. Awesome. So why don't we take a step back? So um, you've done a laundry list of, of incredible things throughout your career, but tell me what got you interested in um, startups and entrepreneurship and kind of tell us a little bit about your journey um, for the audience as um, some may not be familiar with, with who you are and your background. Sure. So I've done a lot of things. It's probably had more jobs than cats have lives in my <laughs> career, more different careers. So I began, I thought I would be a filmmaker. So in high school, I made 50 movies, different movies about everything. And, but my father, he was like a hardcore MIT rocket scientist, engineer. <laughs> and he was like, computers are the future. You have to study computers. So I agreed. I went to, got my undergraduate degree in, in electrical computer engineering, but I realized, you know, I was, I'm good at math, I'm good at computers, but it wasn't my passion. So as soon as I graduated, I just went to grad school in film. So I went to USC, got my graduate degree in film and television. Then at the beginning of my career, I, you know, I didn't really know people in Hollywood. I had just been in film school. So I decided I would the only way to get a decent job that I could think of was to, to figure out how to reach the top people. So I did all this research. I figured out how to get a hold of 150 of the top uh, executives in Hollywood. And I wrote each of them a personal email. And guess wow. what? I got only three responses. <laughs> three <laughs> out of 150. The, the rest just ignored me, but I guess that's normal. Uh, and so the first one, 
that called me was the producer of the Star Wars film, Empire Strikes Back. And he was like, I loved your letter. And he just wanted to talk. And he goes, I don't have a job for you. I just want to talk to you. So we talked for like 45 minutes, but there was no job. And the second uh, response I got was from Disney. And their head of production at Disney invited me in to, to uh, Disney to you know, get my dream job. So I'm sitting there, the interview's going great. I, you know, we got this good report. And then they asked a question and they said, uh, what films do you like? And I had just gone to film school. So I'd seen all these amazing directors, you know, throughout history from, you know, all time periods. Mm -hmm. And I just started to rattle off all these directors and the films I love the most. And then the person looks at me very quizzically and goes, well, what Disney films? You didn't list any Disney films. <laughs> do you like Disney films? And you know, I'm just this young guy. And I was like, oh yeah, I loved them when I was a kid. <laughs> and then uh, apparently that was the wrong thing to say because her expression just went boo and the Whoa. interview was over. Literally, I was, I was not, that was it, that killed it. After that, <laughs> there was no recovering. So I, my third and final chance, I get invited into, uh, it's called Freeze Entertainment. Okay. It, it it was it, it has since then been bought by MGM, but it, at that time it was on Hollywood Boulevard, right across from the Man Chinese Theater, and Ooh. I get into this office and Chuck Freeze, he had produced over 150 movies and television shows, invites me in. He's this big guy, and he goes, "Hey, Hoffman, I, I read your letter. I like it." And then I go, "Oh, great! Can I have a job writing? You know, I wanted to write." He goes, "I don't have any of those jobs." I go. What do you have? And he gave me like the lowest level job possible. He gave me the, the job of a reader. And so what you do as a reader is they give you scripts that they don't have time to read and you're supposed to figure out if it's worth their time to read it or not. That's your, your whole job. So you have to read a gazillion really bad screenplays like over and over and over. So, you know, this one, so I, in this job, I was like, I, I worked really hard. And, and I read all these screenplays and wrote all this stuff. And after, you know, a few weeks, I was so bored. So I contacted Chuck again and I got invited uh, back into his office and he goes, what do you want? Why are you bothering me? And I was like, well, you know, I could do more than read scripts. You know, I went to film school. I was a graduate <laughs> student. You know, I could do more. And he was like, I don't know. You're not even satisfied. Go away. And that was it. <laughs> But sure enough, uh, a week later, I get invited by his son, uh, who is working for him, to actually do a research project. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of just reading, I actually research a whole miniseries and write a treatment for it, which is an outline. And, you know, I was so excited, but his son was this very bitter guy because mm -hmm. he uh, was working for his dad. Like he, and he was in his late thirties, he hadn't made it. He felt like bitter that he had to work for his father, who's this famous guy, couldn't do it on its own. So I was, uh, I went, I basically wrote the treatment. It, he, he, he never smiled except at the end, he loved it. And after that, um, it, it's a long story. I don't know if you wanna hear the whole story, yeah. <laughs> but it's crazy. So a, after the treatment, um, I, he said I did a great job. So the first thing I did was I went back to Chuck. And I said, Chuck, Chuck, he, he liked the treatment. Now can I write? And you know what he said? <laughs> he said, Hoffman, go away. You're never satisfied. <laughs> so he kicked uh. me out. He kicked me out. And, and I go back to reading the scripts. And I go in there like a week later into my office you know, to get scripts from the, the development director there. Yeah. And she looks at me and she looks at me and she's really mad. And she goes, you got me fired. And she jumps up and runs out of the, her own office, <laughs> leaving me in the office. And I'm like, what's going on? You know? Yeah. And, and a, a few minutes later, Chuck's assistant comes in and invites me into his big office again. And I'm just flustered. I have no idea what's going on. I was like, and he goes, Hoffman, you're the new head of development. And that was it. That was like my rise into the film industry. And <laughs> like less than two months, I was in charge of development at this big TV production company. I 
But I was literally, I was like, what do you mean? Like, I didn't understand at first. And yeah. I go back into my office. It, it was her office, right? <laughs> I went into her office, but it was now my office because she was gone. Um, and I didn't know what she did. See, I wanted to be a writer. I kept asking him to be a writer. I didn't know the television business. I mm -hmm. studied film and I didn't even know what she did except hand me scripts. So I'm sitting in her office. I'm looking out the window. It was like a dream. It was like kind of that a combination of, have you seen the movie Barton Fink by the Coen brothers? Yeah, yeah. Bar yeah. You know the producer in that? The big, he was just like Chuck Freeze, the producer. And gotcha, Barton okay. Fink. And then, <laughs> and that, but it was also like Swimming with Sharks, this other film where, you, you know, Hollywood's like sharks. And so I'm in like two films, like right now, I'm looking out the window at the Man Chinese Theater. I'm in this office. I don't know what to do because I just got told to do this job. The phone starts ringing. I'm like, oh, should I even pick it up? You know, well, I get it kept ringing. So I picked it up and then I was like, hello. And it was like a big agency, ICM. And they wanted to send a screenplay and blah, 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 blah. Do I want to read it? Oh, OK, send it. And then I go back into my office and all the other readers start to come in to talk to me and well, to talk to her and like the woman who yeah. ran this. And they're like, where is Karen? Where is she? She's not here. And I'm like, well. I'm sort of doing her job now. And they, <laughs> many of them, I just joined. Like I didn't even, I wasn't even like that good a reader. And they were just like staring at me like, what are, they, they'd, some of them have been doing this years, like many, wow. many years. And they, and, and I go, and they go, and they go, you don't know where the scripts are, do you? And I like, no. <laughs> and so they had to show me how to give them the scripts and they're right over there. Go get them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And anyway, so the next day I get invited back into Chuck's office and he's with his other son. So he hires, it's Hollywood, they hire all their kids, right? And um, I'm there and he, they're talking, him and his son, and I'm supposed to be their head of development. And they were, they, Chuck looks at me and goes, you know, we're doing this TV show and we won't need this actress and she needs to be like this and this and this. And then, Hoffman, who do you think should star in this show? He looks at me like, first of all, you know, I didn't, don't even really watch much television, right? I've yeah. been so busy. I was at film school. Why are you going to watch uh, for three years? Why are you going to watch TV when they're showing you great movies every night, like, like amazing films, right? Yeah. You just aren't going to watch a lot of television. So I had no idea, and I, I really didn't care, you know, who the TV actresses were at the time or anything. So I was, like, totally on the spot, like, to pick somebody. And so you know what I said? I was, like, panicking. I was, like, well... Um, let me think about it. I'll get back to you. I need to think about this. And so uh, I get out of that and I run back to my office after the meeting and I get on the phone and I call my brother's best friend. And my brother's best friend is uh, mm -hmm. an encyclopedia of Hollywood. He has a photographic memory, first of all, and he loves everything Hollywood. And he knows the A-list actors, the B-list actors, the C and the D, and some person who just appeared on a cameo, you know, on some TV series once. He'll know these people, you know? So I name, I describe the actress, we, you know, the type of person we want. And he goes, well, the, the best choice would be this woman. And then, then there's this woman. And, and if you can't get her, then go for her. And so the next day I get called back into Chuck's office and he looks at me, he goes, Hoffman, have you thought about it? Who should we have? I go, I did think about it. And I think she would be our first choice. She would be our second choice. And this would be our third choice. He looks at me, uh. Hoffman, that's brilliant. <laughs> so anyway, every single day I got called into these meetings, these production meetings. Every single day I thought I would be found out and fired. Like it would be over. Like he just fired that perfectly capable woman who was running it, like who knew a hell of a lot more than I knew about the job. <laughs> and they put me in there. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, you know, he's going to find out he's going to find, well, somehow I managed to, like, I started reading Variety and the Hollywood Reporter, which I'd never even bothered to read because they didn't seem yeah. interesting to me. And, Somehow I began, I, and I relied on my brother's friend, and I figured the whole thing out. Like, I figured out what to do. And then after a year, um, I quit uh, because I was like, this job isn't really for me. I'm not writing. I'm just, like, managing, you know, this studio yeah. stuff, which isn't yeah. what I wanted to do. And I got, I, I met the founder of Sega, this game company. And at the time, they were kind of on top of the world. They had their 
Genesis machine and all this stuff. And he invited me, since he was the founder, to come to Japan and uh, come up with ideas for games. So I said yes. So I went back, I quit my job, and he was like, Hoffman, how can you quit? We gave you a great opportunity. And I go, well, you know, I got a chance to go to Japan, and it's really cool, and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, oh, Hoffman, who are we going to find to replace you? And then I thought about it. My brother, you know, he was working in a record store at the time, which yeah. doesn't really have much of a future. You know, records are dying, you know. <laughs> and he was like, he needed a, a real job. He was earning minimum wage. And and I was like, you could hire my brother. And he was like, we'll hire your brother, another Hoffman. So, <laughs> so basically, so basically he brings on uh, my brother. He, he, he brings on my, uh, he hires my brother. And I fly off to Japan. I make games for a year at Sega. And then I quit that job because I was like, uh, you know, you know, I can't really do any, I wanted to do something entrepreneurial. So this is kind of the beginning. Okay. I, I want to make my own games. Like I don't want to just be in this big uh, company. So I moved back to Silicon Valley at that time, start my own game company and it's great. And that's the beginning of my entrepreneurial career. My first game was very successful. It's a whole nother story. I won't go into that. And then, and then after my game company, I do an interactive television company, uh, it, a venture funded one. The game company was bootstrapped. And then I go on to do two other venture funded companies. And after the third one, I'm like taking a break. I've had enough of, you know, I just need a break. My yeah. friends are coming to me and they are um, all starting their companies and they're like, Steve, Steve, how did you raise money? How did you do a business plan? What were, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then I was like, and then I started to help them out, you know, just over coffee and stuff. And then they all had similar questions. So I started to post those on my blog and I called it Founder Space. And <laughs> that was the beginning of Founder Space. So it was a Q&A for like entrepreneurs. And then yeah. I, these, then entrepreneurs who didn't know me, like started to call me, you know, because they had read my blog. And we started to do what we called round tables where we'd get together with them and angel investors and stuff around the table and give them advice and everything. And then everybody's like, well, don't you want to have an incubator or an accelerator? Don't you want to like, you know, take <laughs> it to the next level? And I was like, well, I guess so. So my hobby eventually formed into a, yet another business, another <laughs> startup. And that became Founder Space. And then Founder Space was like maturing. And then we were like, we still people from all over the world started, you know, were coming to Silicon Valley. They'd been coming, you know, but this yeah. was kind of at the beginning. This was in 2011. So it was way back when they were just starting to like flock to Silicon Valley. And we were like, well, they started to look at me and they were like, oh, you do really good programs and you're, mm -hmm. you know, really enthusiastic. Can we invite you to our country? You know? So all of a sudden we had all these relationships all over the world. And I started to, you know, I would give talks to them or we'd send our instructors out then we started to establish incubators overseas now we have a whole bunch of our own founder space incubators in china we're about to open one in australia we do lots of work in south korea and also in europe and it's just it bloomed from there and that and then you know and i've been angel investing in companies i like as well as working with very closely with larger venture funds to fund them and yeah. that's that's how I got started. That's the long <laughs> story, but it could be longer. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's super interesting. And I, I love the fact. So um, one thing that I think is really interesting is that you had both of the uh, computer science, so that very like logic left brain side, as well as the creative filmmaking, right, say, right, right brain side of, of um, you know, thinking. And I, I'm, I'm curious how that played into your whole, you know, just everything that you've done the creativity as well as the, the, the logic and the, um, that sort of business mind. It did. So it very much, my whole career has built, been combining the left and the right brain uh, functions, if, if it's been <laughs> true that, that it works that way. But uh, my goal has always been at the crossroads of kind of entertainment and creativity and new technology and business. Okay. And actually, if you look at the startup world, it's not that different from the film world. Like, you know, there are blockbuster startups. We just happen to call them unicorns. <laughs> and, they, and they pay for all the flops, <laughs> which are all the startups that don't go anywhere. It's a, it's a hit-driven business, just like the film world. And, and venture capitalists are sort of like, you know, these uh, film 
producers or studio execs trying to pick which ones to fund. So they have a portfolio just like a, 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 stu yeah. a TV studio, a, a film or TV studio does. And they're hoping that one of these hits is so big, it pays for all the other guys that don't make as much money. And uh, it's, so it's, it's, there's a lot of analogies there. And then on the creative side, you know, the reason I love this business is not just the business, because I'm actually more of a creative person than a business okay. person. And what I love is engaging the entrepreneurs because the, I love ideas. I love exploring ideas. I like uh, uh, people who are exper kind of pushing the limits of what you can do, whether it's, you know, new types of design, new types of business models, new, t you know, new yeah. inventions that they're coming up with, uh, gadgets and all sorts of stuff. So this business, the, the, be the beauty of our business is that Every single day, I get to, you know, I, I mentor startups. I help a lot of startups, give them advice. Yeah. But I feel like they educate me as much or more than I educate them. Because in helping them, I have to learn all about their business. So if they're like on the cutting edge of, yeah. of CRISPR gene editing technology, then they're explaining it to me. You know, when the blockchain just came out and I was meeting all these entrepreneurs, they're explaining it all to me. When, you know, AI, they're, you, so I am constantly... Uh, meeting very creative, very talented people who are so into what they're doing that they're teaching me and I'm teaching them. And that's what I really, it's a really creative dynamic process. Yeah, no, I love that. And I think that's a really interesting thing to point out, you know, if, if from a, an entrepreneur, entrepreneur's perspective, what's the value of working with an advisor or, or someone else to, uh, you know, the value from the advisor's perspective, right? Obviously yeah. the entrepreneur is extracting information, but it's, you're also helping to educate um, other folks that have had experience and understand, you know, one aspect of growing and scaling a business, but don't necessarily know your technology or your venture and what you're doing that's unique. So I love that. I love that. Where, um, you know, where did you get this like entrepreneurial spirit, this, this, this innate desire to create? Because it's like oozing from you as you're speaking and telling <laughs> these stories and it's, it's contagious, but where do you, where do you get this like love for, um, for creating and ideas? Well, I think uh, I did mention you know, it was when I was young. So it's funny because it's some of it has to be genetic. So my father is this hardcore engineer, like I said, rocket scientist, and my mother is an artist. So uh, you could see okay. that uh, I, I kind of got 50-50 uh, on both sides. And then, you know, <laughs> as a kid, like ever since I was young, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs are this way, you're, you know, they're trying stuff, they're doing stuff, they're running experiments. And, you know, for me, I was totally into games. So I was coding yeah. my own computer games. I was making board games. I was like a game fanatic. I had like made hundreds of my own games and would test them out on friends, which is just like you do with your <laughs> startup, right? I was, you know, testing them, you know, lean startup methodology. And then I was making my own films. And so uh, that's where it came from. And then, but it's the same thing that entrepreneurs do, right? You have a yeah. crazy idea, you have something you're passionate about that you love, and you're going to put it, you want to build it, you want to build it. Really great entrepreneurs, they, they want to see it happen. Right. They're not just out, you know, if they just want to make money, you know, you could go and run a hedge fund. If, if you just yeah. want to make money or there, there's other ways, right? Trade stocks, you know, but uh, to, to be an entrepreneur, you have to build something people really value. They really want. And yeah. and that you and you have to have insights into what people aren't already doing. Like, are, can you do something new, create something different? That's the challenge. Yeah. And and that part has always been with me. And that is the commonality I have when I work with really great entrepreneurs. Gotcha. No, no, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. So how, like, if, if someone is like, I, I know I'm entrepreneurial, I know I want to do something, but I can't come up with an idea. Cause that's something that I hear a lot from folks is like, I, I want to be doing something entrepreneurial, but I just, I can't, I can't come up with an idea. Like what advice do you have to, for, for folks that are like that, that are, that are struggling to come up with something unique, new or, or different? Well, I tell them the best ideas you don't come up with, they come to you because honestly, it's, okay. it's yeah. that way. I mean, you all, it, I, you, there's sort of this mythology that the entrepreneurs, uh, all of a sudden that light bulb goes off and they're like, oh my God, like this is the best idea, you know, and they change the world, you know, Thomas Edison, you, you but the fact is Thomas Edison, you know, if you read the history, he actually didn't even invent the light bulb. There were many people before him who had it. All he did was improve it and got it to yeah. actually work. 
you know, you look at Elon Musk, you're like, he's brilliant. How did he start to come up with the idea for Tesla at just the right time and blah, 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 blah. He didn't invent Tesla that was founded by two other people. You know, he jumped in later. He was an angel investor. Now, Musk is very creative and very dynamic and Tesla wouldn't be what it is today if he hadn't taken it over, but it wasn't his company. He didn't found it originally. Yeah. You look at uh, Steve Jobs, you know, oh my God, he invented, reinvented the graphical user interface, the mouse and all these things. No, no, no. Those are all done by Xerox Park, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm saying if you're sitting in your bedroom trying to come up with the most brilliant idea in the world, it's not going to come to you, right? That's not how ideas. Great entrepreneurs recognize great ideas and figure out where the need is and match that need with the idea and bring it to market. So you look at, and okay. you look at, really good entrepreneurs, they, there's a difference, and a lot of people get this confused, between an inventor and an entrepreneur. An inventor often will invent, you know, like the transi transistor, the people, you know, Shockley and his team that invented the transistor. Um, but the, by the, t you know, Shockley was not a great business person and his company failed, but yeah. uh, he, he invented the, uh, the transistor, but it took like 20 years before that really became a, a big market. And AI, the original inventors of AI, all the algorithms and everything, you know, that took longer than two decades before AI actually began to have really an impact on society and really what it is today. It's been much longer. It's been like half a century since the original <laughs> AI guys uh, conceived of it. Yeah. So um, inventors seldom, you know, like the real Tesla, like who, who <laughs> yeah. Tesla, he, he was an inventor. He was a true inventor and he died penniless and <laughs> he died with no money at all, right? And um, so the really great entrepreneurs aren't inventors. Uh, what they do is you go out into the marketplace and you start looking at all the different things. I always like to, I say something and it's, I think it's really important. The entrepreneur's job is not to invent new technology or invent something totally new. The mm -hmm. entrepreneur's job is to go out into the world and figure out where there's unmet demand. And that unmet demand could be demand for something that doesn't even exist yet. But okay. the technology or all the other pieces to deliver that are now here, and they're gonna actually bring those together to go meet that demand. And that is, the, those are great entrepreneurs. You know, like, um, Kalanick, who was uh, not the founder of Uber, somebody else <laughs> founded it. He, again, he was an angel investor, but he came in later um, in Uber, and yeah. but he was the one who actually figured out uh, how to match what Uber was doing with the real demand, which was uh, not to do the black kind of car limousine service. Uber started out with like kind of expensive black limousines, which is a very limited market. It was yeah. only when they got a a average Joe to drive their car and pick up people. And Uber didn't even invent that. It was actually Lyft. Lyft innovated first on that. But uh, Uber ended up overtaking them by raising more money and everything else. Now they're going head to head. But so all these things, you look at uh, what entrepreneurs really do, and it's often quite different than the myth of the entrepreneur. And, yeah. they, they, and the myth is that you have to have a great idea to start. So I say, you don't need a great idea to start. In fact, it's it, whatever idea you have that you think is great, most likely isn't great. You just haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> so what you need to do is get out into the real world. You need to get out of your room, out of your head, actually out of your head into the real world and start figuring out where people have problems, what you could do, what solutions you could create, what would create real value for these people. If you can figure that out, that's where your ideas come from. They actually come from the people who need them. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. I really appreciate you breaking that down because I think it's, it's a really important point. Um, that, that's really what entrepreneurs do is, is uh, matching unmet demand, finding that unmet demand and, and solving it. I love that. That's really, that's really insightful. What, um, like when you talk about like your experience specifically, right? So you've founded, bootstrapped a company, your first company, the, the game company that you created, and then you did a venture backed one. Can you talk to me a little bit about that experience? Uh, rewind a little bit and, and um, understand like what went through your thought process? Like how were you thinking and feeling during that time? And some of the nuances between bootstrapping versus going venture backed. So whenever you're bootstrapped, you feel like, 
oh, if I only had resources, if I only had the money other people had, because you're like struggling and every, every penny counts and it's really hard. Uh, you know, I remember when I was doing my first company, it was called Lava Mind. It's a game company. And we, yeah. you know, Gazillionaire was our first game. It was this, it was actually <laughs> a game. It was a game that I had thought up. It was an entrepreneurial game. So you're an entrepreneur yeah. and you travel around the, this crazy galaxy of Gog, trading lava lamps and all these different things, trying to build up your business, like growing your, your higher crew. Then your goal is not to overexpand and, and then get in a debt spiral and collapse, but it, you, you have to keep ahead of your competitors. So you always have to expand. So that was the game. Okay. And when we were doing it we did it on a super low budget like extremely low because i had no money at the time so basically i hand drew the art i was coding the game <laughs> it was like my first company you know and it was just it it was you know this the, i like i love to say gazillionaire was outdated the day we released it like it was already <laughs> like <laughs> but it it became like this it became like this hit game because it was so weird and wacky and the gameplay was really fun. It's, you know, we, uh, it's still out there. It's on Steam right now as like one of the classic games and it gets a ton of downloads. It's like amazing. People like write That's me, awesome. it's been, you know, I played it when I was a kid and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and I have kids now and I'm still playing this game. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah, so, so Gazillionaire is still out there. So we made a series of these games. It wasn't easy. Uh, we didn't have, we weren't high tech, so we had to be scrappy. Like we couldn't compete. There were other games out there that were, you know, they were getting million, multi-million dollar budgets and, you know, with these huge teams. And here I was like, you know, just scrapping it all together, um, being a mediocre programmer and, you know, hand-drawn art and all this stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and it was, but it was funny. Uh, it, at the end of the day, people still resonated with the game because we kind of put our hearts and souls into it. Now, yeah. if, uh, but I was always dreaming, well, if I had venture money, like what could I do? If I have this big team, like what could I create then? So after doing uh, three different games, we did like uh, all these kind of wacky business simulation games. They were like Gazillionaire, yeah. Profitania, Zapitalism. And then, <laughs> uh, and after those games, uh, because I couldn't make my movies, I had to make these crazy games. Yeah. And then after, after we did these games, one of my friends, she was uh, working at this uh, studio in, she was my friend from film school, my, my partner from film school. And we were like best friends. And she was in New York, I was on the West Coast. She had just done uh, a, a, an interactive game for Microsoft, like a big budget online, beautiful, like game for Microsoft and uh, her programmer and her wanted mm -hmm. to do a startup. So we matched up, we became, uh, we formed a new company. It was called Spider Dance. And then we went out to raise venture money. And I will tell you, this was like the beginning of the dot-com era and like we were all idealistic, <laughs> but it was tough too. Like at the first, like for the first year, we couldn't raise any money. Like even yeah. though that was our intended goal, we, we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, at that time, there were no incubators or accelerators. There was no lean startup methodology. We were like, just like, we didn't know <laughs> what we were doing. We kept chasing investors, begging them to invest in us. And they would say, well, maybe later, maybe we don't know. Like, you know, so we, our first product that we actually launched, uh, well, no, it wasn't even a product. We were actually doing the lean startup methodology before there was a name for it. So what we did was, we, our idea was we would build the first uh, massively multi-user gaming platform. Like okay. not, there, you know, yeah. multi massively multi-user gaming was just beginning. EverQuest was out there. There was my friend's casual game for Microsoft, but there was nothing else. There was like, it was, it was just the very beginning of multiplayer gaming in real time, you know? Yeah. And we had, the plat we had the technology to do it. Our engineer could do it. So I went out there and I ran around to all the game developers in the Bay Area and Silicon Valley. And it's like, come on, you know, uh, uh, use our platform, use our platform. It's going to be, it's going to be great, you know? <laughs> And, you know, in these days, game developers like to build everything themselves. They didn't like, there wasn't like Unity and all these tools out yeah. there. They just like, they were hardcore coders and they didn't want, uh, they, if they wanted to do it, they didn't want to be beholden to anybody. So they, most of them said no. And a few said yes, but then they wanted all this customization and all these, t and we suddenly realized 
oh my God, we, you know, and they would only give us a small percentage of their, their <laughs> money because they didn't want to give away much of their, their revenue, right? Yeah, so yeah. we did the math and we were like, this won't work. So like after a couple months, we were just, I, I scrapped the idea, like it was bad. At the same time, uh, we were building out uh, 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 this multiplayer gaming system. So we decided we, can't, we don't have the resources to build like a hardcore game. We just don't. There are only four mm-hmm. of us in the company. What we're going to do is we're going to do casual games. So we just, we called it mm. Jabber Chat. Jabber Chat was, a, you, you, you would chat online and play games at the same time with people. And nobody had ever done this and nobody had ever done it as a web plugin. You know, you could actually, a JavaScript plugin where you could just plug yeah. in Jabber Chat to any site. So it was the very beginning of JavaScript, like in that whole thing, you know, where you could plug yeah. in. And so we were like on the Vanguard and we, people saw it and they loved it. They were like, oh my God, you can chat and play all these word games and it's really cool. And hundreds of sites started to sign up for it. And we applied to South by Southwest uh, under their interactive. They had just launched that and we won first place. Like wow. we were like yeah. so <laughs> excited. And then you know what happened? We, we, we had to figure out how to monetize it because we needed to eat. It had been a while since we started the company. So we put in ads. And the first month, our check came. And we looked at the check. We were so excited. And it was not enough money to buy pizza. We couldn't (laughs) even buy one pizza with it. With hundreds of sites using it. Because the ad market wasn't here yet. It was the very beginning. There was no ad market. Like, they were just giving away the ads, essentially. So we were like, oh, my God. Even if we got a thousand times more, there's no business model here at this time. So... We were like casting about like for what to do. And we heard through the grapevine that MTV was going to do a music television game show. Tie, and they wanted to tie it to an online show and synchronize them. Mm. So we had the kind of gaming platform. We hadn't done the synchronizing, all that stuff. Uh, and, uh, but we just started to call them on the phone, MTV, like all the time and leave messages like for their vice president of interactive and say, you know, we have your technology. We're a company called spider dance and you guys got to use us. (laughs) Guess what? They never called back. They didn't call. (laughs) They didn't care. They were like, who is this crazy spider dance people? Why are they bugging me? Like we don't even know them, you know? And my, my friend, because she was working for this big ad agency, she was invited to speak at CES. um, And she, continued to speak there even though she had left the ad company just because uh uh you know so we could get some publicity <laughs> so she kept the <laughs> speaking slot so she went up as fighter dance onto this panel and where she really wasn't supposed to be and uh she gave a talk and then she started to talk about we were building out this platform for interactive television blah 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 <laughs> and you know we hadn't built it yet we were just talking like because we we had some this gaming platform, but you know, we hadn't done anything for interactive television. After her talk, this guy comes rushing out of the audience, runs up to her, looks her in the eye and says, oh my God, you have exactly what we're looking for. I am the vice president of MTV Interactive. (laughs) (laughs) And she goes, I know you. We've been leaving voicemail messages for you (laughs) the past (laughs) month. After that, that was our bootstrap. We got the money. We got like, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and they allowed us to keep all the IP for the platform and just wow. deliver the show to them because all they cared about was the show. Yeah. And so uh, this was incredible. This, uh, uh, you know, we, 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 we had to scramble because they needed it in nine months and it couldn't fail. And we, and we didn't realize how hard it was to build the whole synchronization portion and really to make our game platform scalable. And like they yeah. said, we're going to have a million users log on at once. And we we're like, what? It wasn't the day <laughs> where you had AWS. AWS didn't exist. These yeah. were like, we had one little server <laughs> box in a co-location facility in, in New Jersey. There was just like nothing there. And, and, and anyway, the saga goes on. I won't go into all the details, but after that, we went out and raised our venture funding, which is a whole nother saga. And it was like an incredibly uh, trying yeah. and, and terrifying and almost disastrous uh, endeavor. But we finally closed our first venture round in the nick of time before we went under. <laughs> and uh, that venture round uh, gave us a lot of money. And then it also 
we were like, ah, oh, we reached Nirvana. At, well, for once, <laughs> we have money. Like we had like we had like six point five million dollars in the bank. It was like, oh my God, this is so much money. We can't even believe it, you know. <laughs> and that was that was just the beginning of a whole nother set of challenges. Like yeah. the grass is always greener, and you get there, and then they're like oh my God, trying to scale up the company and doing all these things. And then the ventures, people start to pressure you and there's this huge dot-com thing going on. It was a madhouse. And, but uh, we survived. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, you know, or I, I'm still alive, put it that yeah. way. <laughs> and well, that's what inspired me to write like my next book, Surviving a Startup, because I've been through this and I know so many people have been through it. It's just like absolutely crazy out there. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you hear, yeah, you hear all the the crazy stories about entrepreneurs and um, just like how the crazy hours they have to work and all the different stories. I know. Um, I, trust me, you yeah. ask like running your own company versus running a venture funded company. When it's your own company, it's your own company. It's your own mistakes. Like yeah. you can deal with them. You know, at the end of the day, you can pivot e easily and do all. When it's other companies, sort of, you as soon as you bring on any investors, and especially when you give them a board seat. Uh, they are your partners. Like they yeah. aren't, they are, they want to say in what you do and you have to justify everything you do. And it's a totally different way of working than when yeah. it's just you. So uh, I tell entrepreneurs, you know, you can, there's no problem. You don't have to raise venture money. It like it, today, like I run founder mm -hmm. space. And in founder space, I was offered a lot of money, like from a lot of people. I didn't take a penny. Like I decided with this company, I'm just going to do what I did it three times, like yeah. with other people's money. And with this company, I want to be able to just decide if I like something, I want to be able to do it. Like stop tomorrow and do it. <laughs> like if it's really cool and really amazing, if I don't like it, I don't want to do it. I don't want uh, to have to make my company, you know, yeah. fit a certain business model so that we can become maybe a unicorn, but the type of business I do running an incubator isn't really like a scalable business anyway. So I was yeah. like, these people offering money don't even know what they're doing because they're offering me money for a business that isn't scalable. And, uh, you know, it's not like I can build a gazillion incubators around the world. But, I <laughs> yeah. mean, we work in a way tried, but look at them. <laughs> yeah. Yikes. <laughs> but they didn't even do the incubator part. They just did the, the space. They just did right? the, the, yeah, the They were just like space. a real estate company, uh, but without a real estate model. Um, the, the, so the bottom line, I didn't take their money and I've never regretted that. So I tell entrepreneurs, you don't have to do what everybody else does. It's, they're two totally different types of business and you should find out what, the most important thing I think for people is to do what's right for you. Like, mm -hmm. like for a lot of people and a lot of type of business they want to run for their type of personality they have, running uh, a business that they completely own and control is a much better experience. And, the, and it will, and if it's yeah. a much better experience, a lot of times it ends up more profitable for them because you, ha I know so many people who took on venture funding and they thought they were rich until they weren't <laughs> until like, you know, you know, they're either their companies imploded. They just went, they just like yeah. burnt out, right. They spent all their money and didn't figure things out. Or uh, a lot of times they'll hit a hard time. Like we're in right now, like where the co economy contracts yeah. and they'll get wiped out by that because they're too, if you're small, you can adjust more easily a lot of times. And other times, uh, you know, the, the, there's liquidation preferences and other things that investors get. So if you ever get in a squeeze with your, in your company and you need money, the investors coming in late, they will squeeze you down and they yeah. will demand uh, what they call liquidation preferences, which means that when they, when the, when the company sells, they might get, you know, a two X liquidation preference is twice as much as they invested back before you even start sharing, you know, sharing yeah. the money equally. So there are all these terms they can put in there that are really onerous to you. It, and so, yeah. But once you go down, once you pick a path, it's very hard to switch. Honestly, once you take venture money and you set up for that model, it's very hard to go back. Like it's, yeah. it's just like impossible, right? You have the totally different structure and these other partners on board and everything else. You really should think about that at the beginning. No. Yeah. 
that's really, I think that's a really important, important point that you bring up. And there's also this myth of, you know, I'm going to start my own company, get venture backed, and I can still kind of do whatever I want, but eh, it doesn't quite work that way. It's not, not quite that simple. It's not, not always that simple. Yeah. yeah. Some of it, if you have like the outsized personality, sometimes you can do it. Like you, everybody will just bow to your will. Um, but it's, uh, it depends on you. If you're a more accommodating okay. person, you can't, I'm a type of person. I'm a kind of, I want everybody to be happy on the team. You know, I'm not just like w ignore, push people aside. And so uh, I would want my partners to kind of be on board, but other people, they'll just do what they want. And yeah, um, that's for them. Actually, it, it's a better fit, like, because they're going <laughs> to do what they want. They don't care what other people think, you know, yeah. there's certain, certain personality type where they really don't care what anybody else thinks. And that way investors complaining doesn't bother them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, that's a good point. It's a good point. So what, um, like, what's, what's the difference now running founder space now that you're helping companies grow? What's, what's kind of like your perspective and take on, um, you know, how found, founders should grow and scale and create, create the really good businesses from, you know, the incubator, incubator advisor side? Oh, I have so much advice. We can't do it all in this episode, but Fair enough. <laughs> I will tell you, first of all, as a startup, there's a lot of mistakes. So people, it's very, I made most of these mistakes myself, fortunately, for you, for the startups, not for yeah. me. I mean, <laughs> I was unfortunate that I made the mistakes. I had to suffer through them. But I learned the hard way so I can really empathize and really understand. But, you know, a lot of startups, they fall in love with their idea. They're like, oh, this idea is so, you know, great. And they, they put on these blinders. It's very easy to do. All of us have our, our blinders. We only see what we want to see. Sure. We, and, and they will filter out bad news. They'll filter out uh, news that doesn't agree with what they already think. And that is one of the biggest dangers, honestly, that startup mm. founders have because it, it stops them from getting the right data so they can make the right decisions. You know, they always say, stick with your vision, stick with your vision. Like you have a vision, you're supposed to stick with it. But honestly, the great entrepreneurs out there mm -hmm. never stick with their vision. They are constantly evaluating new data and they're constantly uh, changing course uh, to adjust to that data and trying to figure, uh, let the data guide them instead of their uh, predetermined assumptions of what they think should be true or how they think the world should work. And that a lot of times is what I'm up against because I okay. will sit down with entrepreneurs. I want to help them. And I, you know, and I never force an entrepreneur to do anything, but I'm always, and I never try to be mean to an entrepreneur. Like I never like would just criticize them for the sake of criticizing them. I don't believe that really helps them, but I'm always very honest because I feel like, why are you coming to me if you don't want me to tell you what I really think? So I say it in a nice way, but I will tell them, point out what I think are the flaws and when I'm done with that, mm -hmm. I will tell them, look, you don't have to trust me. I'm just one point of view. And I, you know, I'm wrong half the time anyway, but I am a point of view. You should take this data and you should go out and be receptive to what other, ask other people and find out what they say yeah. and get as many points of view as you can. And then be open to the fact that this might not be working and, yeah. and you might have to change. And I hope when I plant those seeds, I don't always get to see uh, whether they actually make the change or not. Sometimes they disappear off my radar. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I hope when I have the chance to point those out that they, it opens their mind up enough to do that. Now, people, I find that the people who make the best entrepreneurs are, are the ones who have, who don't feel defensive about it. They don't feel like uh, they have to be right all the time. They are willing to take in lots of data and they are willing to uh, uh, think analytically. And it doesn't mean that you aren't passionate. It doesn't yeah. mean that you uh, don't have a vision, right? You always have a vision. But what it does mean is that uh, you, know, you understand that the world is always changing. So whatever your vision was, whatever you thought was true like six months ago may no longer be true. There yeah. might be new technology out there that totally changes your business model. The markets may have shifted out from under your feet. You know, there, all these different things are moving. Competitors may have come up with solutions that you didn't even conceive of, but you might not actually realize that. Um, and so the process of being an entrepreneur is the process, I call it, it's a process of discovery, continual discovery. 
And when I'm with entrepreneurs, I'm on that discovery trail with them. We're trying to figure it out together. It's not like I have the answers. Yeah. A lot of times I may just have point them in a direction and ask them like, look, uh, you tell me your customers want this, but can you prove, show me that they actually do? Because you're just telling me, like I, you're not yeah. giving me any proof that they actually want it. Like I want it, I want it something tangible that shows me that they really, really need this because everybody says like, when you go up to somebody and you show them your product, they all say, oh, that's a nice product, you know? Yeah. And oh, come back when it's ready. We'll, we'll try it out. You, you, what they're actually saying to you is go away. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to yeah. talk to you. I don't want to engage further. Come back later. You know, they're not saying they love your product, but an entrepreneur who hears what they want to hear, they vote, oh, they love it. They love it. Everybody <laughs> loves it. But they're not saying that. If they really loved it, they would be like, give me your product. Like, yeah. I need it right now. Can I pay you for it? How can I get it? Like, please. If that's the reaction, like they need to get, but we all tend to distort things. And I think that's where like, as it, uh, the role of an advisor or having outside advisors is so important. I love that. And the, the aspect of discovery and just being open to new ideas, because if you're shut off and this is the way that we're going to go, no matter what, you don't leave yourself open to actually pivot and make decisions. And as you mentioned earlier, find the demand and meet the, where the demand actually is. So um, Steve, I want to transition a little bit. So um, I run a a startup right now that is focused on uh, personal finance and financial well-being. So I want to pivot a little bit into that. Mm-hmm. And I'd love to know, how would you describe your relationship with money? Ah, money. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> no, uh, it's, uh, to me, uh, I mean, it's important to have enough money so that you aren't uh, stressed out. Like, yeah. it's really bad if you're on the edge. Um, when I do, I've been fortunate in my business that the first one worked, but I've always uh, gambled with my own money as opposed to like friends and family money so i never i didn't want to ruin those relationships so i never went to them and uh i said well i don't know if this is going to work this crazy game or whatever i was doing at the time you know and and a lot of them didn't work some of my ideas worked and some we lost money so whenever you're trying something new you're taking a huge risk yeah and i figured for me with my personality type, I didn't want to uh, lose those relationships or even have the stress of those people stressed out about their own money. Um, So I always took money from professional investors. I figured if they, they're, they're supposed to be smarter than I am. If they, if they lose their money, like that's their job, they're professional, you know, (laughs) if they're, if they invested in me, you know, it's not my fault. (laughs) They would have invested in some other bad investment. No. Um, So that, that's been my, kind of my outlook. And I've always been actually, I take big risks in my life, like huge risk. I'll risk my own money a lot. But at the same time, I'm never foolhardy. Like I always, like, I don't want to be living on the edge. Like I don't take out, like it would never fun to start up on credit cards or stuff like that. That's just, uh, you know, take out a second mortgage of my home to do a startup. That's just, you're begging for disaster. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a great perspective. That's interesting, the not wanting to, to touch other people's money. So I, or friends and family specifically, yeah. you know, I think that's something that you hear a lot of advice of go raise from friends and family, but. Um, I figure if your idea isn't good enough to get a professional investor to invest, God forbid your friends and family should give you the money, <laughs> right? Because, you know, True, the yeah. professionals aren't going to touch it. If you can't convince a professional to give you any money, you know, why are you going to get money from, and you, you know, why are you going to take money from your parents or your grandparents or your, your aunt Jenny who needs it to retire, you know, or your yeah. best friend who won't be your best friend after this is all done? Yeah. Yeah. No. And I'm also hearing that you're valuing the relationship over the money, which I think is another important thing to point out. That if you, to me if you go a, a layer big, deeper. Yeah, that's a big thing because you you can always make more money in your lifetime. You will survive, but those relationships may not survive. They uh, they they could be permanently broken, and I've seen it happen. Yeah. And look, if they really want shares, if they want to share in your dream, give them some shares. Like you know, you could give them a small amount of shares in your company, and they they won't know what they're worth because nobody knows, right? <laughs> and. <laughs> And they're totally like happy, like, oh, we got some shares if it's ever, been, you know, and, yeah. and, and then they're your supporter and everything else, but the, it, there's no stress. There's, you know, you're not, you're not taking their money. They don't lose anything. They can only gain. 
Yeah. No, that's I like I like that kind of uh, that kind and of. And then deal. they'll be there for you when things don't work out and you need a shoulder to cry on. There they are. Like, oh, I lost my shares too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. What would you say is the best investment you've made? Ah, uh, so I will tell you the best investment anybody can make. You know, whether you're an entrepreneur or not, and that is always to invest in yourself. Like first. Like before you throw your money out there to the stock market and give it to some company, before you uh, put your money into, God forbid, uh, become an angel investor and give it to some <laughs> other entrepreneur, <laughs> it's probably going to fail. Um, you know, and there's a million, before you go and gamble on crypt cryptocurrency, uh, trying to make your fortune, um, I, you know, the most long term investment you can make that will pay off, you know, a thousand fold is in what you learn and know your so anything you can do to improve yourself your mm -hmm. abilities uh, your knowledge uh, your relationships things like that those are really good investments so i tell entrepreneur uh, people who want to be an entrepreneur or even if they're already an entrepreneur you know don't just start gambling your money in all these other places. Keep that if you really want to be an entrepreneur keep the money for you now yeah. you may start a company right away or you may uh say just having money in uh, let's say you have a savings account like just having savings yeah is a lot gives you affords you so many opportunities like literally when i said i had no money when i did my first startup i had saved for my previous job as a game designer mm -hmm. and i had enough money to live frugally for a year but if i didn't have that money to live frugally for a year, I mean, I didn't have any money to spend on my company, but I wasn't yeah. going to starve. I couldn't have taken that risk. The same thing, like if you graduate uh, college or and you want to take a job, if you have no money in the bank, you're going to have to take whatever job's available. Like it, it might not be your dream job. It might not be the right job even for your career, right? But you're just going to yeah. have to settle. But that first job is so important because that first job, you meet people, you do stuff, it, it, and it leads to the next thing, and it leads to the next thing, and it leads to the next. All these things have repercussions. If you're able to say no, 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 and then wait and find what's just right for you, that could open up a whole new opportunities that you would have never had otherwise. If you can invest in yourself and get a graduate degree that can allow you to enter into a position you otherwise wouldn't have had. Yeah. Even just, uh, if you can just even give yourself time so that you can go out there and like when you're doing your startup at the beginning, instead of just diving into it and trying to fundraise like a lot of people do, if you can take your time and actually st really get to understand the market and the customers and all of these things, and then uh, through that process, actually discover where you should go instead of just picking something and trying to do it quickly. Uh, that can make all the difference. I, I see for entrepreneurs, they very seldom spend enough time up front. They're usually too worried about raising capital and everything else <laughs> and being a startup, quote unquote, instead of figuring something out. And so that is where I would put your money. That's my advice. Interesting. No, I love that. I love that. What would you say is the best and worst part of entrepreneurship? The best and worst part, it's, it's like a yin yang, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like they're, they're tied together. You cannot separate them. The best and worst part is the uncertainty. So the, the beauty of being an entrepreneur is you never know what will happen tomorrow. Like, and you, you could like wind up being incredibly like rich and famous, or you can just like wind up like losing everything, yeah. <laughs> and living in a hovel and, you know, and your whole life crumbling around, you <laughs> You're just, you know, and it happens like both ways. And, uh, but it also, uh, it's, 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 that's what makes life exciting, right? That you don't know what's going to happen. Like I could never have, the reason I'm an entrepreneur is because I could never have a routine job because if I know what I'm going to be doing uh, next year, and the year after, or even next month, it's not that exciting for me. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'll be doing this for yeah. the next, you know, the next five years. I don't want that. Like, I want to go out into the world and like discover and experience and have all these amazing, uh, 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 crazy things that happen to me that would have never otherwise happened. And so, but along with that comes the worst part. It's the crazy uncertainty, like the the you know that yeah. you're, uh, you you can never count on anything, and that there's always a crisis. It seems 
like going on um, because in a startup there always is right there's always yeah. something that's broken or you know oh my lead programmer is unhappy are they gonna quit they're gonna quit oh they did quit oh my god <laughs> <laughs> you know and then you're like I have no programmer now oh what do I do and I have no money and that's like normal <laughs> yeah what would you say is the dumbest money mistake that you've made oh Hall? my god <laughs> There are too many to count. Like, my goodness, you know? I, like, make dumb mistakes all the time. You know, I owned Amazon early on, and I didn't hold it. So that was pretty dumb. Like, <laughs> yeah, it seemed high at the time, and then, oh, my God, this is a great deal. I made so much money. Whoa. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, if I just did, just held that, like, that would be great. Um, there were, you know, one time, at one point, uh, you know, I got a big buyout offer for one of my companies and we didn't take it. That was stupid, right? That was a yeah. much bigger money mistake. Um, uh, we were like, we, we thought we were on top of the world and we didn't take it. We should have. That was a good deal. Um, but you look in hindsight and you realize those things. There are so many, uh, uh, I will tell you, like, if you're, if you, well, I, you know, I'm always astounded by how, how many mistakes I make, and <laughs> how stupid I actually am. Like, yeah. like, oh my God, I make so many mistakes. Like, that's amazing that I'm like, even keep <laughs> going, you know? Um, so, uh, but I think the important thing uh, for every entrepreneur uh, is to just laugh at your own dumb mistakes, right? Because you are who you are. You're going to like, everybody makes yeah. mistakes. Like nobody is infallible. Anybody thinks they're infallible. Just is not being is, is delusional yeah because <laughs> you only have a limited amount of information coming at any one time like nobody yeah. has enough information to ever always make the right that you cannot get that type of data right so you couldn't and we're not computers also we're emotional beings right we're not like machines that can process like that massive amount of data and actually come up with a conclusion uh yeah so if you can forgive yourself for that and laugh at your own mistakes and not worry about them, then it's fine. Like, I'm like, okay, I've did a lot of dumb things <laughs> and, yeah. and I did a few good things and they, uh, you know, but uh, on the whole, uh, well, I could go on and on. Well, I won't talk. Yeah. <laughs> you're, like, you're good. Yeah. I know. That's a, that's a little, another so crazy dumb thing that. I did. Another super costly thing is like, I had this engineer who was not a cooperative guy but I felt like if I lose this engineer, the whole project is going to fall apart. I kept that engineer on uh, way too long. Like it was Ugh. the day I got rid of that engineer, I was like suddenly realized I should have fired that person like a year ago, right? They were so dysfunctional. Wow. Like, uh, like they would not communicate. They wouldn't, but I was putting up with all this stuff out of fear, right? That yeah. you, you, that person's going to walk away and our system will collapse. But you know, and that's a dumb thing to do. Like that's a dumb mistake that cost um, us money and time and all this stuff. <laughs> yep no and that's the emotional side there that fear that was that was uh, yeah, yeah. that was leading you what would you say is the biggest challenge facing everyday americans when it comes to finances ah oh, the biggest challenge so i think everyday americans the biggest challenge probably is saving money is simply saying uh you know how do i effectively uh put aside no matter how small and it's really hard for some americans you know yeah. i i it, it because they just don't have much money to put aside but how can i put aside more of my paycheck every month for a rainy day because life is so precarious and there's so many unpredictable things that can happen like we're seeing right now you know yeah. if you're if you're running a restaurant or a retail store and you're a small store owner and this, you know, COVID-19 comes along and all your, you know, you get shut down. Like how much runway do you, you know, how much do you have aside, right? How long can you keep going? It's, yeah. it's really, really hard. The more you can do that, the better off you'll be. But I'm afraid, you know, I read these reports uh, on Americans and how much mm -hmm. debt they have and how little savings and like that the average American can only go two weeks before they're totally broke. And yeah. I'm like, oh my God, you know, that is scary. So I've always been more uh, conservative with my money. I'm always trying to, even though I take big risks, you know, you got to balance it out and yeah. you've got to uh, forego some of those tempting things that, 
you know, they may make you feel good in the short term. Like, you know, if you took that vacation that you may feel great while you're on the vacation, but you get back and you just blown like $3,000 that yeah. you could have put aside uh, for when you really, really need it. And, yeah. and that, like, could you get the same enjoyment of going to Acapulco or people don't go there anymore because it's too dangerous, but uh, <laughs> some other place, yeah. <laughs> some nice, beautiful, you know, Tahiti or wherever you want for this <laughs> like dream vacation. Could have you put that money aside? Not sp if you don't have it, like, of course, if you have the money, go on the vacation. Right. But it, if, if, yeah. you do, if you don't have a lot, if you aren't able to save much money, could you do something locally where you make yourself have a lot of fun, like something out of the ordinary, like, but that doesn't cost, there's so many things in life that don't cost a lot of money that are like yeah. just amazing. I will tell you, like going on a beautiful hike to a new location that you drive to that you've never been to, you know, is an amazing yeah. thing and making kind of an event out of it, you know, bringing wine and, you know, music and all this stuff. It doesn't cost you anything, but it's like, can be so beautiful and amazing. You know, little things like reading a great book, like can be so yeah. eye opening and, and it doesn't cost you anything, you know? So I'm just saying if, if people are out there, think about those, like try to do substitutes, you know, for the yeah. big expensive stuff for, for the other stuff and then put away more. That is what financially I would recommend. Perfect. I love that. I love that. Well, Steve, thank you so much for your time. Um, what would you like to leave the audience with? I'll leave, I'll give you the floor, talk about sure. you know, some of the things that you're working on. And then obviously please uh, let us, let the audience know how they can connect with you and, um, you know, learn more about what you're doing at Founderspace and everything else book wise. Yeah, so. you can go to founderspace.com or email us at vc at Founderspace if you want to contact us. We have an, a really cool a three month online program on Founderspace that you, a bunch of videos of me and stuff that you could sign up for. It's very cheap, but because it's tough economic times, if anybody cannot afford it, you will give it to you for free. Like you can just go there, you can look at it and you can just contact us because uh, if you, you know, it doesn't cost much, but we really, some people are really hurting right now. And we don't want to deny anybody uh, uh, some education. So you can get it for free. Comes with our startup kit and everything. I have my books, like um, I have uh, Surviving a Startup, which is going to be published by HarperCollins soon. So that will be coming out. And Make Elephants Fly, which is all about getting your, the elephants your big dream and getting it off the ground flying. <laughs> uh, that is out right now in bookstores everywhere and online. And I would love it if you read it and write a great review if you like it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, Captain, thank you so much for uh, for your time. We appreciate it, and uh, this has been really insightful. So I appreciate you sharing your knowledge and experience and telling us some of the stories. Uh, it's thank been a lot of fun. Thank you. You're great. You ask really good questions. I mean, you make it really fun. You have a uh, a fun personality, <laughs> a good energy. A good <laughs> well, I appreciate vibe. that. Yeah, I can get the vibe. Yeah, yeah, you it, get the it's vibe. easy talking to you. So <laughs> thank you. Take care, and we'll do more later. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, Take sounds care. good. All right, that concludes today's episode of the Silicon Alley podcast with Steve Hoffman. What I love about Steve's story is one, you can just feel the energy coming out of him. And he's got some really funny stories of things that didn't go well, things that did go well, and just his entire experience. So absolutely fascinating guy and fascinating story. And please take advantage if you are a founder or someone that is in a tough spot right now, please take advantage of the offer to get the, the Founder Space course the uh, online incubator course for free um, right now, especially with everything going on with COVID. I think it's a great opportunity to build and create and iterate and come up with new businesses. But if you're in a tight spot, don't let that stop you. Take advantage of it. And if you would like, please connect with Steve and Founder Space and make sure to pick up his books if you are interested. Yeah. So uh, that's it for today's episode of the Silicon Alley podcast. I'm William Glass, CEO and co-founder of Ostrich. And of course, your host of the Silicon Alley podcast. Thanks so much for listening and watching. Love you guys. Have a good one. You got no time to waste, but still you hesitate.